The American War for Independence began well for the Patriots in the South. In Charlestown, South Carolina, later known as Charleston after the war, an unfinished Palmetto Fort remarkably withstood cannonballs from the British fleet in 1776. Men like William Moultrie, Francis Marion, William Jasper, and others became Revolutionary War heroes. One more shot for King George! Four years later, the American Revolution was deadlocked. In the North, battles were won and lost with little effect. General Henry Clinton and the British High Command decided what they needed was a Southern strategy. Our goal in the South is to support the Loyalists and restore the authority of the King's government. The British decided to bring the war to the South for a couple of reasons. One was political, going on back home. Uh, they hadn't really won any major victories. The other reasons was they thought that there were a lot of loyalists here in the South, uh, particularly in the two Carolinas. And if they captured the Southern colonies, they captured the most valuable colonies. More than 6,000 British troops were shipped from New York to Charlestown. This time, after a short siege, the city fell. The entire Continental Army of South Carolina surrendered, and Charlestown found itself under martial law. Paroles were revoked, and rebels were ordered to swear an oath of allegiance to the Crown. Charlestown would supply the British Army with provisions and become the base of operations to secure the interior of the Carolinas and achieve victory in the South. Americans opposed to the British were known as Patriots, Whigs, Rebels, or Partisans. Americans on the British side were called Loyalists, Royalists, Tories, the King's Men, or Crown Forces. In colonial South Carolina, the British had developed a system of townships. The British township system evolved in the 1730s to provide for orderly settlement of the frontier. And if you look at the earliest ones, they were to ring Charleston with settled areas. The townships protected the low country from French, Spanish, and Indian attack. The back country, or up country, of South Carolina was populated by Scots-Irish, also known as Ulster Scots, Welsh, Dutch, Germans, French Huguenots, and other Europeans. Many of these settlers landed in Philadelphia and came down the Great Wagon Road from Pennsylvania. These men and women were hardworking, religious, and independent. Make ready! They didn't know they would be fighting a war for independence sooner rather than later. The first major battle in the backcountry occurred May 29, 1780 at a place called the Waxhaws in the Catawba River Valley. Colonel Abraham Buford was leading a regiment of Continental soldiers from Virginia to South Carolina to help defend Charleston. When he realized he was too late to do any good, he turned around. We run into a group of soldiers that was come up from Charleston, which we learned had just failed to the British a few days before. Colonel Buford told us that we was to join his group and march back to North Carolina to defend our state from the British advancing behind us. I was driving a wagon loaded with supplies. Lieutenant Samuel Patton, North Carolina Militia. General Clinton sent a lightning fast unit of Loyalists recruited from the Northern colonies to pursue Buford's men. This British Legion was a combination of infantry, cavalry, and artillery forces led by Lieutenant Colonel Bannister Tarleton. Tarleton was a driven person, but he was 26, a British officer who had shown an aggressiveness in battle that uh, far exceeded his uh, experience and age. If he saw a challenge, or an enemy, he was a, he set upon them. He didn't waste any time. The British Legion caught up with Buford's army on the Rocky River Road, about four miles south of the North Carolina border. Buford set up his 350 men in a line, uh, it was called a single line. Buford didn't give the order for his men to fire until it was too late. Tarleton's horses struck the line of Patriot soldiers. 
British swords and bayonets did far more damage that day than musket balls. The Americans were mostly uh, inexperienced soldiers. When you have mounted horsemen raining, raining blows down upon you, many of them threw their guns down immediately. But it was over in 15 minutes. In 15 minutes, there was 113 Americans dead on the field. In the confusion of Buford's men, asking for quarter, trying to surrender, many were killed. We didn't learn until the next day what had happened. The British attacked our men full force, and after our lines had fired, they rushed and massacred our men even after they had raised a white flag of surrender. The Battle of Waxhaws was a turning point in the Revolutionary War, but not for reasons the British might have hoped. Their intent was to make the backcountry colonists feel the heel of the boot. But instead of disheartening the opposition, Buford's massacre rallied Patriot support. Many Patriots, who had previously surrendered, rejoined the fight, determined to repay the harshness of Tarleton's Quarter with a vengeance of their own. I call it the Alamo moment. And that's what the galvanized the people of the, the backcountry to rise up against the British. There were lots of bloody engagements, but the Waxhaws kind of set the tone for the conflict in the backcountry. Terror begat terror, and it, it was an increasing cycle of revenge and violence by both sides.